Good evening, this is Jemima Beakers. First up, let's have a look at today's headlines. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jemima Biegas. We have in studio today Dr. Eric Zubain from the Center for Disease Control in Namibia. Uh, he'll be talking to us about the vaccine and the conspiracy theories around it. Thank you for joining us, Doctor. My pleasure. Now, uh, Doctor, there, there are lots of uh, fears and theories around the uh, f vaccine that Namibia is expected to receive in the next few months. Can you please share with us some of the concerns that your office has picked up? Oh, there's so many, Jemima. <laughs> It's hard to, to remember them all, but uh, we hear conspiracy theories and myths about uh, that there's a microchip in the vaccine. Of course there isn't. There's no way to put a microchip in a vaccine. That, mm -hmm. that isn't really a thing. We hear similar stories about 5G and the disease with 5G and that the virus or the vaccine will make you uh, somehow get sick from 5G. There's no relation. 5G has nothing to do with the virus or the vaccine. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work that way. Uh, we hear stories that this is a plot uh, by Western governments to, I've heard, make men infertile. I've heard to make women infertile. I've heard to make children one day infertile. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't affect the fertility uh, or, or the reproductive system in any way. Uh, we've heard about uh, theories that the vaccine changes your DNA, that it goes into your body and somehow uh, makes you a mutant. It changes your DNA in a way that you might pass to your children. It doesn't do that. That's not how these vaccines work. They don't go into the nucleus of your cells. They can't change your DNA. There's just nothing to that. Um, we hear that the vaccine actually will make you sick, will give you the disease. It doesn't work that way. It can't do that. And there's actually been millions of people around the world that have already received the vaccine. So we can already see that they are not getting sick and we don't see large numbers of them dying. Mm -hmm. Some of them have died and that's because the vaccine is usually given when it's first available to those who are uh, at most risk of dying anyway. And particularly in Norway, people have heard about this group of about 23 people who died shortly after getting the vaccine. This was a group of people that was very frail. They were old, they had conditions that meant they were sick and dealing with a lot of things. That's why they were prioritized to get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the fact that some of them ended up dying even after getting the vaccine because they have these other sicknesses, that's not that surprising. But the, the vaccine cannot give you the virus. Uh, it doesn't have 666 in it. Uh, it doesn't, uh, it isn't created out of aborted fetus tissue. Just there's so many things like this that cause people to have fear and worry when the thing that we should be concerned about is the virus. That's mm -hmm. what is actually been killing people. It's killing people here in Namibia every day. Around the world, over 2 million people have died. As of today, just in the last 24 hours, the world hit 100 million infections. That's just a number we can't wrap our heads around mm -hmm. for something that we only learned about just a little more than a year ago. So um, unfortunately, all these confusions and, and myths around the vaccine, it's not helping the situation, but it's good that we're talking about it. People deserve to know the truth. Now, Doctor, you've also talked about the number, the number 666, 666. Um, there's also a lot of re religious views that uh, people are using to go against this vaccine. Can you share with us some of the concerns that you have picked up in your opinion on this? Yeah, you do get the sense that some of these concerns or even some of the rumors and myths about the vaccine are being spread in our churches and our Christian communities. So. I would say to fellow Christians, this is not how we should be looking at this. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you're a believer in God, then you believe that all good things come from God. Mm -hmm. And the vaccine is included in that. Mm -hmm. This vaccine is something that we've been able to design as an agent of healing, mm -hmm. something that can remove sickness, mm -hmm. remove suffering, uh, take away deaths that aren't necessary. That's a very good thing. We should be celebrating it. Um, the idea that we should put ourselves in harm's way, avoid the vaccine or avoid wearing a mask and just trust in God to protect you. That's not scriptural. That, you know, we're, we're told what to do with that kind of a, of, of a lie. And it says, you know, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Mm -hmm. So I think the Christian community should see this as a benefit and a way to help serve humanity. Now, Doctor, the, the CDC, ha CDC has um, been in, uh, supporting the Namibian government for, for some time now in rolling out uh, uh, health care programs. Um, looking at the experience that you have in, uh, with the support, um, what would be uh, the ideal way to roll out this vaccine plan once it arrives in Namibia, um, taking in consideration this, uh, the structures and the demographics of, of Namibia? Yeah, Namibia has some advantages here in that it's generally a low population, a low density population. So you have less of a population that needs to be reached, but much of that population is spread out over very large physical distances. So that will be one of the challenges. The good thing is the Namibian government uh, has pulled together all the stakeholders, meeting consistently about this and looking at these questions before the vaccine's even here. And that's the time to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen some places in the world where the vaccine arrived and the plans to get it out to the people weren't quite ready yet. Mm -hmm. We're trying to avoid that here and make sure that we know exactly what we're going to do the day that vaccine arrives. So to your point, that will involve getting it out to other parts of the country. Um, you know, obviously it comes into the cities and then from there you have hubs that can get it out to some of the rural areas. Uh, that also is going to be affected by who should get it first. And that's policy that the Namibian government will make ultimately, but it will probably look similar to what most countries in the world have started doing. They're looking at first at the elderly, at the healthcare workers, people that are in, in the most direct uh, line of, of being exposed to this virus and, and potentially the most harm to be done. And then you start spreading it out from there and looking at people with pre-existing conditions, mm -hmm. uh, looking at essential workers like teachers, mm -hmm. like police officers, like people working in the shops and delivering the mail and these things. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, Doctor, what lessons can Namibia learn uh, from other countries like the US, for instance, that has already rolled out this vaccine plan? I think one of the big lessons that everyone is learning right now is that speed really matters. Um, anyone who's ever flown on a very large plane, uh, and not, not the small planes, you know, that go up to, to Katima or Oshikari, but if, if you get on a very big plane, you know that they board in groups. You, you call one group to get them on the plane and then another so that there's a little more order so people can get on faster. If you start at the back of the plane, then you don't have a lot of uh, log jam at the front. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you don't wait, when you call a group, you don't wait till every single person it, from that group is on the plane. As soon as the line starts slowing down, you get the next group moving and the next group. I think we have to look at the vaccines that way. We do want the highest priority people to get it first, but we can't do that in a long drawn out way that slows down overall vaccine delivery. We try to get them in there fast. And then once we see that there's time, we start getting the next group and the next group and the next group ready as well. Now, Doctor, like you've said earlier, obviously uh, uh, there's been groups of people that have that are prioritised by the government when it comes to well, once the vaccine is in Namibia. Now, how can an average uh, Namibian or Nam person in Namibia who does not fall in these categories, how can such a person uh, safely access the vaccine? Um, when it becomes available for them, they mm -hmm. they will wait longer than the people who need it the most. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it works when you have a limited resource. Namibia, just like every other country in the world, is not going to receive a, a big shipment of vaccine that is enough to immediately cover everybody. Mm -hmm. They're gonna get enough for a certain amount of the population and then more and then more, and it's going to take time. The thing for that person to know though, even if you yourself are not at high risk, you don't qualify yet for the vaccine when it starts getting rolled out. Mm -hmm. You're being protected. The fact that the healthcare workers that you need to be there for you if you get sick or injured from any cause, the fact that they are more likely to be safe now 
that's good for you. Mm -hmm. The fact that your family members at highest risk won't be getting the virus also means they won't be passing it to you. So you will be benefiting, but it will be good for everyone to know when it is their time so that when it's available for them, they can also go and receive this vaccine. Now, Dr. Lastly, um, this is the time that schools are reopening. Um, are there any advice you would like to g share with parents, and particularly teachers, on how to manage schools during this time? There is good evidence around the world right now that if done well, if, if the virus is taken seriously and the protective measures are done thoughtfully, schools can actually be a very safe place to operate. We have examples from other parts of the world where schools have operated and when they've been studied, there were very few infections happening in the schools. But that requires a very serious approach. It means the children wear masks during their lessons. It's okay, they can breathe. My children, they wear their mask all day at school and they breathe just fine. We're sitting here talking to each other with our mask on. The oxygen is getting to our lungs just fine. So the children can wear the mask during their lessons. They can be spaced apart. Hand hygiene can be performed. The teachers must also be wearing their mask. The teachers might be the most at-risk people in that classroom. Um, and, and we wanna make sure they're protected as well. So if those things are done, schools can actually open quite safely. I think the teachers should be pushing the school administration to make sure that these safety measures are in place for their own well-being. Mm -hmm. We don't wanna see uh, teachers dying. My home state in America has had several teachers die in the last few weeks after the schools reopened there. And it's terrible. Um, but parents can be a part of that too. Parents should know what the schools of their children are doing to stop coronavirus in the schools. And if they're not satisfied with their plans, they should be vocal about it and, and be agents of change so that those plans can improve and the school can be safer for everyone. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us, Doctor. Happy. Thank you for tuning in.